This is about the Hamatech DS1104. That's Hamatech, not to be confused with Hantech. And I bought this one with the AdSense money from reviewing this scope, which I liked its simplicity and cheapness and lightness, but I found its performance lacking, so I figured there must be another budget scope that's better. And this one, the uh, two-channel version of this one, is actually a little bit cheaper even than the Fnerzy. And like the Fnerzy scope, this one runs off of a USB power adapter, although this one uses 8 watts, not like the 5 watts of the Fnerzy, which means I can't quite run it off of this tiny little power bank. But running off a USB power adapter like this means the scope doesn't actually have actual ground connected to it, unlike my Rigol. But that can be an advantage, but it's also a disadvantage because these adapters actually send quite a bit of noise in through ground. So right now this is picking up a waveform just off of the air. It's set to 50 millivolts per division with a probe at 10x. And if I just put my hand near that probe, that signal gets a lot stronger. And that's because this scope's ground is bouncing around. In fact, if I take the probe from my Rigol and hold it up to my Hanmatech scope, I get a very similar sort of waveform showing up. So it's this thing's ground that's bouncing around. And I can make this bouncing around a lot less by just connecting the ground clip from my Rigol to this one, which gives this one actual ground. And now we just have the occasional little spikes, which is still coming from the adapter, but it's much less bad. But at least on this one I can see it because I can crank the sensitivity up to 5 millivolts per division or 50 millivolts at 10x, whereas on this one I can only go to 50 millivolts at 1x or 500 at 10x. Still, it's not as sensitive as my Rigol though. The reason I got the 4-trace version of the scope is a while back I was experimenting with the stepper motor. It's got 8 wires coming out of it and it turns out it has 4 actual distinct phases. So if I turn this I can see the things coming up. I'm using roll mode on the scope. And let's stop that. And now we can zoom in on that. And we can see just barely maybe there's 4 separate phases but I can only zoom in so far because this thing has a 20k trace buffer, that is 20,000 samples, but it's shared between the four channels. It's not a lot, but it's still a lot better than this one. It only has 700 sample trace buffer, but not like the 3 million of my Rigol. But if I turn off two of the channels, now I've got my trace buffer shared between two channels, so now it says depth of 10k before it was 5k. And now if I zoom in, I can zoom in a lot further, but I've only got two traces. So now having set a short time base, which I can't do in roll mode, and trigger at this level, if I turn the motor, I get a shorter sample on there and more detail. And now if we zoom in on that, I get jaggies on the waveforms, and this took me a while to figure out. So at this zoom level, so I've only got 10 samples per division and 2 milliseconds per division, and zooming all the way out, now between those cursors is 300 milliseconds, so 10 samples over 2 milliseconds times 300 milliseconds over 2 is just 1500 samples, not the 5k that it claims. And I thought this was because I was using 4 traces and I felt a bit ripped off at this capability. It took me actually a day to figure out what's going on. So the problem is the scope is still in run mode waiting for another trigger, it's just not triggering. If I put this in stop mode, and now I can zoom in. And look at that, I can zoom in a lot further and the jaggies are gone. So on this scope, if you want to zoom in effectively, you have to put it in stop mode. But there's nothing in the user interface that makes that clear. And that run stop button is inconveniently located way down here where it can be hard to reach, especially if it's on the bench itself. Whereas on this one, it's very nicely here. And on this one, it's up here. Notice I've turned this one off because the cooling fan on that one is super annoying which is one thing I like about this scope. It doesn't have a fan. And inconveniently, there's no modern stepper driver that can drive a actual four-phase motor like this. Modern stepper drivers, though, have micro-stepping capability, which essentially allows it to step in between the steps, so you don't need the four phases. So this is just an interesting curiosity from the 1970s. And this is the only time I've ever really wanted a quad-trace scope. And now I'm using this inverter chip to just make a nice square wave. Let's push the auto set button to acquire that nicely. And I'll use the cursors to measure that. Inconveniently that button is down here. And now let's move 
cursor A, and I have to actually turn that quite a lot to move a distance. Select the other one. A lot of turns on here. And that's an 80 kilohertz square wave. And this is something that's actually easier on the FNERSI. I just push the H cursor button and that puts me in the cursors. And I move one of them and then I push the right arrow button to move the other. Now they jump a little bit but they're easy to move and there's actually a gear shift for the cursor. So I push slow and now I'm in slow cursor moving. And select the other one and it says 76 kilohertz. But my Rigol doesn't need a gear shift or lots of turns because if I turn this knob fast it goes in big steps and if I turn it slowly it goes in small steps. Now I want to look closely at the falling edge. Right now I'm triggering on the rising edge and to change the edge type is awkward on this scope. I have to pop up this menu, click on next page and then I can select which edge I want. And let's zoom in on that a lot. That's now at 10 nanoseconds per division. On the FNERSI, switching the edge is just a matter of pushing this button here, and now I'm on the falling edge, and let's zoom in to 10 nanoseconds per division. And on the FNERSI, that falling edge has got nice round curves to it, whereas on here, there's a pretty sharp corner here, and a little bit of a bounce down here. Same on here, sharp corner, and a little bit of a bounce. And that tells me this one is probably interpolating, or at least it doesn't have the bandwidth it claims to have. This claims to be 100 megahertz. This one says it's 110 megahertz. Probably fairly honest about that. This one is 200 megahertz. And that's with all the probes set to 10x and calibrated to their respective scopes. Because if I switch one of these probes to 1x, that loads down the circuit a lot. So switching the FNERSI to 1x makes it obviously bigger on here. But on the other ones, you can see how the waveform changes quite a lot just from the loading from that scope probe. Now at this time base, this one is sampling at 1 giga samples per second. It has a 20k trace buffer. And if we switch this to dots, you can see where the actual samples are. But if I enable another channel, now I'm down to 500 mega samples per second because that's shared and have a lot fewer dots. But annoyingly, if I enable channel 3 as my second channel, I'm down to 250 mega samples per second with just a 5k trace buffer. So if I use a channel from this column and a channel from this column, I'm effectively sharing four channels even though I'm only using two of them. Which is really annoying because on this scope it would make sense to use channel 1 and channel 3 preferably because you have physical sets of buttons for those. But the way it works, you don't want to do that. You'd want to use channel 1 and channel 2 at which point you have to keep switching which channel you want to use for those buttons. So it's a bit stupid. They should have put channel 1, channel 2, channel 3, channel 4 so that you could use channel 1 and channel 2 with their own sets of buttons. And the final thing about the importance of trace buffer length, let's examine this uh, cordless toothbrush charger. And I'll just put my probe with a ground clip on it like that over here and it'll inductively pick up what's going on in there. And you can see this waveform every once in a while dips in a little bit. With the Rigol, if I do the same thing, we can see the little dips in here shown as uh, multiple samples at the same time, so much better. But uh, examining these dips on here, Let's uh, zoom out by changing the time base to be something much longer. And I've zoomed out now that I've always got two of these on the screen. And putting the cursors on the dips, I can move both at the same time. And now I have to turn that a lot. And unfortunately the uh, thing is hidden behind this menu here, but I can reposition the trace. And with the cursor on both of these it says it's happening 60 times per second. So it probably has something to do with the 60 Hz AC that the thing runs off of. But the signal gets more interesting if I put the uh, toothbrush on here. See now it seems to be all jaggy and let's stop that. And I'm pretty sure we have some aliasing happening here to not give us the true thing of what's happening. Whereas on the Rigol with a much longer trace buffer, I can zoom in enough to see what's going on in detail. And we've got these little bumps on the waveform because this one has a 3 million sample trace buffer so I can see a lot. Actually I'm wrong about this, actually 6 million, 3 million if it's shared between both traces. Whereas on this one if we're zoomed out far enough to see those dips and now I stop and I try to zoom in on that it just doesn't look like that at all which means I have to acquire this at a much shorter time base which means I don't get the whole waveform.
and there now we see the little spikes on there too and finally a bit about triggering uh, I'm decoding this remote control with the sensor here and the scope is monitoring that and you can see every time I click it triggers more than once so if I want to see just the start of that I could go into the trigger menu and configure the hold off to be something long enough or I could just use a single shot trigger which I put in here mode single and now if I click on this that triggered more than once huh let's try that again and now I went back to auto single and it triggered just once and it went to stop so now if I want to trigger again is there some kind of button to redo a single trigger? If I push this button, it goes to auto. I don't want that. So I have to go back to single on here and click on it again. And if I want to re-trigger, I have to go back through this menu and do single trigger, which is just annoying. And sometimes it seems to double trigger, even though it's on single. And single trigger is used enough that you really should have a button on it like this. And so if I push the button here, it went to stop because it triggered and if I want to acquire again I just push single again and click the button. So the fact that I have to go through a menu here to reselect single and re-trigger to get another trigger just seems overly awkward. So what's my conclusion on this scope? Well it's a good honest budget scope. Uh, it does what it says it does. It has the bandwidth that it claims to have and considering that it's the same price as this Fnerzy it performs much better not as good as my Rigol, but the Rigol costs twice as much. Now it does have quite a few frustrating user interface bits where if only they change this just a little bit it would be easier to use, but those aren't really that big of a handicap. It's just to me, having used other scopes and realizing, well, this could be much easier if only they had thought about this a little bit more, it's frustrating. But if it was my only scope, I don't think I'd be so annoyed about that.